there are some... Okay, thank you. So just that was just the notification that we're recording the meeting today. My name's Sonia Johnson. I'm a professor of social and community psychiatry in the Division of Psychiatry at UCL and lead for the Loneliness and Social Isolation and Mental Health Cross-Disciplinary Network, which is the focus of today's presentations. It's great to see such a good audience. Please do, unless you're asking a question or something, please do stay on mute. Could I ask though, if you're not still in your pyjamas and if you're up to it, it would be fabulous if people could switch their screens on, get their, their cameras on, because actually I think it's just very nice to be able to see some human faces. It all makes it feel a little bit more like real life. And it doesn't do any harm to the quality of the call for people to have their cameras on. So it'd be fantastic to see some of you. That's that's great. It's lovely to see some faces actually appearing rather than little black rectangles. Thank you very much. So this seminar is, I think it's the second of the Catalyst seminar series in children and young people's mental health, which has the very exciting objective of bringing together people from across UCL who are focused in various different ways on children and young people's mental health, both for the purposes of the seminar series and in general to hopefully stimulate more cross-disciplinary working in this area. And loneliness and social isolation is an area in which we have been managing to initiate quite a bit of cross-disciplinary working, particularly through the UKRI network for which we've got funding for people here and at a number of other institutions and in the voluntary sector to work together with the focus of loneliness and social isolation and mental health. And I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about that network and about some why, lonely, why young people are one of our priorities. And I'll then go on to present three speakers before handing over to Essie for a panel discussion with several more excellent speakers. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen and just introduce you to the activities of our network. So the network is cross-disciplinary both at UCL and elsewhere. There are several people who work with me in the Division of Psychiatry where this is based, but other co-ops at UCL include Essie from PALS and in the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience, Ros from Ros Shaffron from the Institute of Child Health, whom you're going to hear from, and Laura Vaughan from the Bartlett School of Architecture. And also we have important collaborators at the Royal College of Music, the London School of Economics, and quite a few other institutions across the country. The questions on, we're fo on which we're focusing are firstly about prevention. So can interventions that target loneliness and isolation prevent mental health problems developing in the first place? And secondly, can outcomes for mental health problems be reduced? by focusing on loneliness and social isolation in people who have mental health problems. The, the disciplines are quite an exciting range. So psychology, social psychiatry, sociology, digital technology, various aspects of the arts. We've also got philosophers and historians involved. It has been a very stimulating experience really having a series of seminars and discussions in this group. And there's a major role in our network for a co-production working group consisting of people with relevant lived experience who've co contributed to multiple ways to our activities. The kind of things we've done with our funding have included scoping reviews, various events, establishing research priorities, We've had a budget to fund 12 small grants 
and we're now working to try and seed and develop bigger applications. We're also conducting a qualitative investigation of loneliness experiences in people with severe mental health problems. And an aim from the beginning has been to increase the focus, although we don't focus only on young people, we've been aiming to try and increase the degree to which loneliness and mental health research does focus on them. So our achievements are, sorry, I hadn't quite realized my slide was animated. That's what comes of pinching slides from the net, network coordinator, Ellie, who's going to talk to us in a moment. But this just summarizes some of our, the things that have been achieved in the first couple of the years of the network, which includes having over 600 members, various communication channels, including Twitter and Slack, accounts that you're welcome to link up to us through. This qualitative study is carrying on. We've had various open to the public cross-disciplinary events focused on our work. And as well as funding these small research studies, we also have ourselves attained some extra grant funding. And one of the projects is the one that Ellie will tell you about in a moment. So why young people and loneliness? Well, just a very quick introduction to the topic. The so loneliness is, the main thing about it is that it's subjective. It's a sense of not having sufficient high quality connections with other people to meet what one feels one needs and would like. It's increasingly apparent that it's associated with both physical and mental health problems. Interestingly, the research on physical health actually came before the research on loneliness and mental health by and large. The, and the starting point of fulfilling people's stereotypes about loneliness was what we search largely about older people, but more recently it's become very apparent that the 16 to 24 age group and others in that sort of zone are at high risk for loneliness. And what's important about them is, of course, that they're also at high risk of the onset of mental health problems. So for that reason, it seems a promising focus to think about loneliness at that time. Loneliness is probably various different kinds of experience and it may be that young people are particularly experiencing psychological forms of loneliness where they don't feel connected, even though they have quite a bit of contact with other people objectively. Stigma is certainly a considerable issue, so acknowledging feeling lonely is hard, maybe even harder in that age group than in others. And research, you'll hear about some very exciting developments, but on the whole, it's still quite a lot less than in older populations. And since you asked, their loneliness really doesn't seem to be just to do with the internet and with their digital world. So what have we done about loneliness, about loneliness in young people in the course of our activities? Well, You'll hear a bit more in the moment, but we've tried as much as we can in the reviewing work and our qualitative study to make sure that we include a good level of focus on young people. We've done some studies, including the one that's on this slide, which is a, a meta-synthesis of, of the qualitative literature on loneliness experiences and depression in young people. We got a bit of funding led by Rose Shaffron and Ellie Pierce from the Wellcome Foundation to study loneliness in young people. We're just starting on a qualitative study, looking at young people's views about what sort of interventions they might actually accept in this area. And we're hopefully moving forward. We're actually submitting a grant application this week and we're moving forward to have writing groups and try and move towards larger scale grant applications in this area. So that's 
just a quick introduction to the loneliness network that we're doing and to why focus on young people. I now like to introduce the first of our speakers, who is Sam Fadgasemi, who's a PhD student in PALS at UCL, and he's one of the early career researchers in our network. And he's going to tell you about his fascinating qualitative study exploring why many young people are lonely currently. Over to you, Sam. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sonia. Hi, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen now. So if you just bear with me for a moment. Can everyone see my screen? Okay, let's see. Perfect. So yes, as Sonia said, I'm a PhD researcher at PALS and I'm delighted to talk about uh, the causes and experiences of loneliness from the perspective of young people in London's deprived areas. Okay, so to give you the context, um, uh, although um, loneliness has historically been associated with older people, we now actually have evidence that shows that in fact young people, particularly those between the ages of 16 to 24, are, uh, are most lonely uh, and most vulnerable to loneliness. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and for example, the Office for National Statistics found that almost 10% of young people reported feeling lonely often or always. And this figure is actually three times uh, higher than that of older people. Um, so um, unfortunately, loneliness has, uh, is linked with a number of uh, physical and mental health problems. For example, amongst young people, it's been found to uh, be linked with immune deficiency, poor sleep, psychological stress, depression, and anxiety, amongst others. Um, so now we know th from research that young people are actually the loneliest uh, demographic, but we don't know much about what could be causing these or what the experience of loneliness is like for them. So here's where um, our research comes in. So we wanted to find out what is it about, uh, the we want to find out the subjective causes and experiences of loneliness among young people. So what young people actually think causes their loneliness and how they perceive their experience of loneliness um, to be like. So in order to achieve this, uh, we conducted a systematic qualitative study on 48 British born males and females between the ages of 18 to 24 living in London. We chose 18 to 24 year olds instead of 16 to 24 uh, because of ethical issues to study those under the age of 18. Um, in addition to age, um, lower socioeconomic status, unemployment, renting, and living in the most deprived boroughs were associated with higher levels of loneliness among young people. So we did an in-depth analysis of a representative sample with these qualities and circumstances from boroughs of Newham, Hackney, Tower Hamlets, and Barking and Dagenham, which were ranked as the, um, as the most deprived boroughs in London. So we set out to answer several questions. What are the subjective causes of loneliness for young people in London's most deprived boroughs? What is the experience of loneliness for them? What role does social media play in this? And how they actually cope with their experience of loneliness? For our procedure, we use the free association task, which is a method used in qualitative research to get people to um, express 
uh, their experiences about a given issue. So this uh, free association task actually enabled us to have access to people's um, unconscious processes to uncover uh, their thoughts and feelings about their experiences of loneliness. It is termed the grid elaboration method. And in the next slide, I've got, uh, I'm gonna illustrate how it looks like and what we did. So here is a couple of examples of the grid elaboration method, which we used in our study. Um, so participants were given a grid of four empty boxes and were instructed to, I'm just gonna read the instructions at the top. So we, we're interested, so this is what we said, we are interested in what you associate with the experience of loneliness. Please express what you associate by way of images and or words. Please elaborate one image or idea per box. Sometimes a really simple drawing or idea can be a good way of portraying your thoughts and feelings. And then we elaborated, um, we uh, elab basically continued with this um, in an interview style after they finished the free association task. So for example, I asked them, can we uh, talk about what you've put in box one? And then we asked probing questions such as, can you tell me more about this? Or how does that make you feel? And so on. Now in terms of the, uh, the so this is basically the summary of our themes. Uh, in terms of the causes, young people believe that the feeling of being disconnected, contemporary culture, pressure, social comparison, change in life events were uh, the causes uh, to their loneliness. Now, in terms of experience, they associated isolation, negative feelings and thoughts, coping, positive orient and positive orientation to aloneness, uh, to be associated with the experience of loneliness. We've just, um, we have a paper under review that's likely to be published with the experience one, and then the causes one where we're, we're sort of finalizing that. Um, unfortunately, I don't, we don't have time to go through all of these uh, themes. I've just uh, selected the first two for each, which we'll, uh, which we'll um, examine a bit further. Starting with the causes, um, 65% of the, the sample uh, believed that the feeling of being disconnected was a contributor to their loneliness. Um, in particular, not being able to express myself, my feelings or my issues, feeling not understood and feeling I don't matter were um, the, the common codes. I've got a quote here that captures this theme. So it says, what I'm going through is so extreme and it's only me in this and people around me are not even going to get it. So I'm just gonna like be consumed by what I'm going through, not reach out. And that leads to me just feeling even lone, even more lonely, lonelier than I did before. Yeah. Um, issues to do with contemporary culture were another cause of loneliness from the perspective of young people. For example, social media as a fake portrayal of reality was one code. Another one was not being true to oneself, as well as the lack of face-to-face -face social interaction and care or empathy from people. Um, if you do live in London, you have a lot to deal with on a daily basis, regardless of if you're having a quiet day. This couldn't be a lot of what's happened. And so we're all caught up in our lives enough that we that becomes difficult um, to become even empathetic to people. And so you do get a lot of times when you look around a train and see an empty face looking at you, not even with any judgment or anything like that. That sort of thing adds to the whole, the coldness of loneliness. Now, moving to our experience, um, I, uh, 81% of the sample um, perceived isolation to be associated with the experience of loneliness. In particular, feeling isolated, excluded, or left out. The sense of loneliness despite being surrounded by people, even friends and family, and social media and exclusion. When you see pictures that you're not involved in, and it just generally seems fun, 
that's when you start feeling alone because you're not with them. You're not going to be in the background smiling or anything. It's more you sitting down on your bed or something and you're looking, tapping, seeing that loads of photos. You can't, can't really escape these kind of photos and these situations where you're gonna be bound to be and when you're not involved in. Um, also, 81% of the participants um, said, uh, talked about a range of uh, interrelated negative feelings and thoughts to be associated with the experience of loneliness. For example, sadness and depression, overthinking, fear, and worry and anxiety. I just worry about situations that probably will never happen. But yeah, I, I will think of every possibility and it's just, it upsets me as well, because why am I the type of person that sits there and worry? Like, I want to be not like a carefree, but like a carefree person where I can just sit there and not care about what others think and the labels on me or their opinions on me. Um, so in terms of our discussion, we, what we contributed to the literature is the exploration of the subjective causes and experiences of loneliness among a sample with characteristics and qualities and circumstances identified as the loneliest, which has never been studied before. Um, and the free association technique uh, really enabled us to have access to deep laid thoughts, feelings, emotions, and unconscious processes of, of young people regarding their experiences of, of loneliness. And in fact, uh, we derived a range of fascinating uh, symbols from our study that young people use to associate with their uh, experiences of loneliness. And in terms you, of practical you, implications, pardon? Could you wrap up please now? Yeah, of course, of course. Thank you. Yeah, in terms of our practical implications, because young people spend a significant portion of their times on social media, you know, on social life, for example, we suggest, you know, in disseminating online videos for healthier use of social media, and also for schools to offer mentorship and career counseling to ease off pressure, as well as CBT and mindfulness to be able to manage unwanted thoughts and feelings. And I've got my acknowledgments to my supervisors, the Human Wellbeing Grand Challenges, and UCL PALS. Thank you very much for listening. Sorry for the short that's, presentation, that's, but thank you. Brilliant, thank you, it's right length. Thanks very much, that's fascinating. Pleasure. Okay, so another early career researcher from the network with another fascinating and complimentary perspective. We're very pleased that Tim Matthews is joining us actually from over the river at King's, not that it makes any difference now. And he's going to present a more epidemiological perspective on loneliness in young people from his major work in that area. Thanks, Tim. Thanks very much, Sonia. Um, I'll just get my slides up. Okay, can you see that? Great. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to be presenting some recent findings on loneliness in the context of victimization experiences. So we know from a wide body of evidence that exposure to violence victimization during childhood and adolescence is a risk factor for diverse negative outcomes, including mental health problems, um, lower educational um, attainment, and risk markers for inflammatory disease. And just to illustrate, this is um, from a paper published by my colleague John Schaefer, showing that the more forms of victimization a person is exposed to, the higher the burden on their mental health. Uh, but one potential outcome that perhaps hasn't been explored as much um, in the literature is loneliness. And there are many different reasons why a person who's been victimized uh, may be at greater risk for loneliness. Um, just as an example, being bullied by peers could frustrate children's need to feel accepted in a peer group. Emotional maltreatment might disrupt the formation of secure attachments. Uh, victims of sexual assault may end up suffering in silence because they don't think they'll uh, be believed. So there, there are many different ways in which victimization could give rise to loneliness. <clears throat> and in order to study this, we really need to recognize the ways in which the type of victimization can vary, not just in terms of the nature of the act itself, but also the perpetrator, the context, the severity, 
uh, and also the developmental period in which it's experienced. <clears throat> Uh, something else that we need to be uh, mindful of is that um, many psychological traits and indeed many ostensibly environmental exposures are to some degree influenced by genetics. And we know from twin studies that people's vulnerability to experiencing loneliness is partly influenced by genetic factors, um, as is their risk of encountering victimization. And this can be an obstacle to drawing causal influences about the effects of victimization on loneliness because the correlation between them could be accounted for by shared underlying genetic vulnerabilities um, that we can't measure in um, uh, conventional studies. But one way we can address this is using twin studies, um, which offer the opportunity for a kind of natural experiment. So if you have a pair of um, identical twins where one twin has been victimized and the other one hasn't, and the victimized twin is more lonely than the non-victimized one, we know that can't be explained by genetic factors because both twins share 100% of their genetic um, makeup. So this is a very powerful test that allows us to get closer towards conclusions that would normally require experimental manipulation. So to that end, I'm going to present some research uh, that I conducted in the Environmental Risk Longitudinal Twin Study. Uh, this is a birth cohort of 1,100 pairs of twins born in the UK during 1994 and 95. And uh, the participants have been followed up via home visit assessments when they were aged 5, 7, uh, 10, 12 and 18. <clears throat> we have measures of loneliness from the age 12 and 18 assessments. Um, so at age 12, it was based on a selection of items from the children's depression inventory uh, that refer to feelings of being um, unloved, not having friends and feeling alone. And then at age 18, we have the short form of the UCLA loneliness scale. <clears throat> Uh, victimization in childhood was based on a combination of parents and self-reports collected repeatedly between ages 5 and 12. And for every study participant, a dossier was compiled about their victimization history. Uh, and these dossiers were then reviewed by uh, clinicians and researchers um, and classified as uh, physical abuse, physical neglect, um, emotional abuse or neglect, and bullying by peers. Um, adolescent victimization uh, was assessed using the juvenile victimization questionnaire and it captured self reports of maltreatment, neglect, uh, sexual, family, peer, crime and cyber victimization spanning the ages 12 to 18. So we tested associations between loneliness and victimization firstly cross sectionally um, in childhood and in adolescence and then longitudinally so this first set of results shows associations between childhood victimization and loneliness at age 12. Um, the bars reflect regression coefficients and the error bars are the 95% confidence interval. So if the error bars overlap with zero, it means uh, a non-significant effect. And for the purpose of this talk, I'm only showing the bars for severe victimization. So they were all coded as either moderate or severe, um, but these bars here reflect the coefficients for the severe categories. Um, and so we're seeing significant associations for emotional abuse and for bullying um, and uh, for uh, uh, physical abuse, the association is just about on the borderline. As a next step, we used a fixed effects regression using the family unit as the cluster variable and restricted our sample to uh, monozygotic twins. So what essentially that means is we're testing whether victimization predicts differences between genetically identical twins in the same family. So does the victimized twin score higher for loneliness? Uh, and if that's the case, then we have strong evidence for an environmental effect of victimization that is not explained by uh, genetic confounding. Um, now, it wasn't actually possible to do this for physical neglect or emotional abuse uh, because there just weren't enough pairs of twins who were discordant uh, for these exposures. But we do find that bullying victimization is sig uh, significant, so it's associated with loneliness over and above these unmeasured genetic effects. Uh, next, we looked at whether victimization in childhood uh, predicts loneliness later on um, at age 18. Um, so we're looking at the same victimization exposures but the y-axis uh, now reflects age 18 loneliness. And so initially we see the phys physical abuse and bullying remain associated with loneliness. Um, but when we then run those fixed effects uh, models to control for genetic influences, uh, both associations are non-significant. So even though bullying is an environmental risk factor for loneliness concomitantly in childhood, this more long-term effect seems to be mediated by genetic influences. So you could think of it as genetic factors shaping the recovery trajectory. So this doesn't mean that bullied children are out of the woods if the bullying stops. Uh, to the contrary, it suggests that they may need extra support with the transition into adult life. 
Uh, finally, we looked at victimization during adolescence um, and how that relates to loneliness in adulthood. And what we found is that all seven forms of victimization predicted loneliness at age 18. And then once again, when we uh, subjected these associations to that more stringent test of the fixed effects model in MZ twins, at that point, um, some of the associations become non-significant or marginal. Um, I should reiterate that we coded victimization as either moderate or severe, and these bars only uh, show the severe group. Uh, we actually found a significant association in the moderate maltreatment group, um, whereas we don't for the severe one. Um, it could be uh, an issue of statistical power there. Um, and we also found that um, uh, the other two forms of victimization that survived this test were neglect and uh, in particular cyber victimization, um, which had the, the strongest effect. So uh, to sum up, we find that loneliness is associated with diverse forms of victimization, uh, with bullying and uh, cyber victimization being particularly important. Um, what was also interesting was that experiences such as neglect were particularly relevant for loneliness when experienced in adolescence rather than in childhood. Normally we think in terms of earlier exposures being worse for outcomes, but loneliness is a phenomenon that um, often seems to behave quite differently from other mental health related outcomes in terms of how it's associated with risk factors. Uh, and then finally, the discordant twin analyses indicated that genetic influences may um, influence the, the more longer term effects of, of bullying. Um, so that brings up the question, why is bullying particularly relevant for loneliness? Um, well, firstly, in childhood, children's social needs very much revolve around being accepted in a peer group, and bullying is quite clearly a, a frustration of that need. Also, um, if you imagine a lonely child in the, the school environment, um, you know, they look around and they see their peers enjoying fairly typical and positive relationships with each other, and then they compare that with their own troubled circumstances. Uh, uh, circumstances that could re really bring a, a real sense of injustice and, and a sense of being um, the sort of not the odd one out. And then thirdly, bully children often feel that they can't tell an adult um, about the bullying because they think they can't do anything about it or it might get worse. Um, so that could be very isolating um, in that sense as well. And then uh, what about cyber victimization? Um, this is quite a funny one because cyber victimization rarely occurs in isolation. Um, if someone's being victimized online, it's very likely that they're experiencing peer victimization offline as well. Uh, and despite that, unlike peer victimization, cyber victimization emerged as um, the one thing that was most um, strongly an environmental risk for, for loneliness. Um, now, cyber victimization has a number of unique characteristics compared to other types of victimization. Um, first of all, it doesn't take place in any particular physical location. Um, the perpetrator might not be known. Um, and also, it can continue happening even if the victims remove themselves from the situation. So it could have unique implications uh, for loneliness. Uh, on the other hand, it could go the other way. We know that uh, lonely individuals are more likely to use digital technology in more um, habitual compulsive ways. So they spend more time online and that could simply increase the probability that they'll have negative or hostile encounters. Um, and that's something that we're going to explore uh, further. We've just collected some data on young people's online experiences and loneliness. Um, so I'll be taking that forward very soon. Um, but for now that concludes my talk and I thank you for listening. Wonderful, thank you very much. It's extremely interesting as well. Okay, so the third of our talk is from our own Dr. Ellie Pierce, who's in a research fellow in the Division of Psychiatry and very much the most important person in the loneliness and social isolation and mental health research network, as, as she's the coordinator and the person who makes things happen, basically. So Ellie's next. Thanks. Thanks very much, Sonia. What a lovely introduction. Um, Tim, could you stop sharing your screen so I could share my slides, please? Or Maya also, I think you can stop the screen share as host. Okay, I think someone's missed the memo here. <laughs> Oh, great. Email. email people. Brilliant. 
Um, so we know from longitudinal evidence that childhood loneliness seems to predict increased risk of depression and emotional symptoms up to 24 years later. And there's also a negative feedback loop between loneliness and social anxiety in adolescence over time. Loneliness has been found to mediate the relationship between anxiety and depression in both school-based samples and young people in residential mental health care settings. So from this, it seems plausible that by addressing loneliness, we might be able to prevent or alleviate anxiety and or depression in young people. Um, and to start looking into this, we conducted a review with these two research questions. So in what ways and in which context does addressing loneliness appear to prevent and or improve anxiety and depression in young people and why? And in which ways and in which context and for whom does addressing loneliness appear not to work and why? So our new searches of the academic literature involved a predefined research strategy. And we then invited feedback from academic experts and young people with lived experience. And this led to further iterations of more targeted searches, for example, looking for papers related to stigma and eating disorders. We also included papers in the 14 to 24 age range related to loneliness and mental health outcomes from recent systematic reviews by uh, one by Alice Eccles and Pam Coulter and the other by Ruman Ma and her colleagues. And we also included two unpublished MSc projects that report interviews with third sector staff who are working with young people around their thoughts on loneliness and how to address it. And we also included reports and resources from the third sector and from policymakers. We conducted a critical interpretive synthesis, which included principles of a rapid realist review. And what that means um, in less uh, technical language is that we looked at themes from discussions with our lived experience group of young people, and we coded the academic and grey literature based on those themes. We then extracted what are called synthetic constructs, which are basically overarching concepts that encompass the evidence from different sources. And then we combined these synthetic constructs into a conceptual framework, which we then took back to the group of lived experience, um, people with lived experience for their feedback. And through these iterations, we developed our final framework. Um, and I should say that we, we didn't focus on outcomes because many of the studies we included were underpowered and looking at feasibility. Uh, so the results can't really be interpreted meaningfully in terms of effectiveness. And that's why we concentrated on developing this conceptual framework. So based on our research questions, three main constructs were synthesized from the evidence, which were context, i.e. who interventions might work for in terms of different causes of loneliness, content or the key elements of interventions, and mechanisms of action or why certain elements might be effective for particular people. And then across these three constructs, there were intrapersonal, interpersonal and social constructs. Intrapersonal contextual factors underlying loneliness are psychological barriers such as not trusting others, low self-esteem and whether an individual is experiencing anxiety or depression. Intrapersonal strategies include, for example, cognitive behavioural therapy or self-help strategies like self-help apps, sport, maybe using social media. And plausible intrapersonal mechanisms are creating more positive ways of looking at oneself and others, building purpose and building identity. Interpersonal contextual factors underlying loneliness are lacking social skills and social confidence. And interpersonal strategies aim to improve those skills. And these may work through building social confidence, social skills and building trust. Social con contextual factors are lacking close relationships with friends or family or not feeling part of a wider social network or community. And social strategies include increasing social support, for example, through going to a peer support group or having a mentor or providing opportunities for social engagements, such as music making or playing sports. 
And these strategies allow individuals to build meaningful relationships and realize that they aren't the only ones feeling like they do. Of course, socioeconomic factors um, also underline loneliness, but we in this model focused more on intrapersonal, interpersonal and social constructs. A key element of effective interventions seems to be that they are designed, co-designed and personalized to respond to individual needs. So the content, con the content con constructs here are a bit like a menu to choose from depending on which contextual factors resonates for an individual. Potential barriers, i.e. what factors might mean that an intervention might not work for someone included individual level psychological barriers or situational barriers like work or caring responsibilities, practical barriers such as digital, physical or financial exclusion, and social barriers such as stigma or an unsupportive home environment. Our lived experience group talked about strategies needing to be co-designed to fit the needs of the individual and interventions may need to incorporate multiple content elements from the framework to be effective. For example, the Entourage online platform uses a strength-based cognitive therapy approach to helping people, young people overcome social anxiety, but it also has peer and professional mentors to provide social support. The few studies that measured loneliness outcomes after social skills training were targeted at individuals with autistic spectrum disorder or social anxiety. So we don't really know whether this approach is more widely applicable. Changing thinking around attitudes to self and others through therapy and building trust through having ongoing social support seem to help young people already experiencing anxiety or depression. Having supportive peer groups that had shared experience, for example, hospitalised young people doing music therapy together, or online forums for depressed university students, seem to help reduce loneliness. The key mechanism of action here was recognising that shared experience and realising you're not the only person feeling that way. It's plausible that some of these groups may also have helped provide identity and inadvertently helped individuals build social skills and social confidence. Overall, the most promising approach may be interventions that flexibly combine or offer the choice of some form of cognitive therapy, sustained social support, and perhaps with um, someone experiencing severe anxiety or depression that needs to be one to one support and peer groups that share specific shared experiences, such as bereavement or being an overseas student. Um, so one thing we was clear from this review was that we definitely need more properly powered trials, particularly working with chronically lonely young people and which measure anxiety and depression as well as loneliness outcomes. At the moment, studies don't distinguish between transient and chronic loneliness, and it seems to be chronic loneliness that's associated with mental ill health. And most interventions target groups that might be at risk of loneliness, but they don't target those who are already lonely. Other areas for potential interventions that were raised by our academic or lived experience experts but weren't addressed in the research literature were those involving the built environment, the stigma of loneliness and mental ill health, building identity, positive family relationships and cognitive biases that are known to be associated with loneliness such as hypersensitivity to social threat. And I think from Tim's presentation, also bullying um, seems to be very important here as well. So the emerging evidence we have is unclear on which strategies have significant outcomes for whom specifically. However, therapeutic approaches and social support might help those with existing social anxiety or depression and the lived experience group suggested that therapy might pave the way for them being able to take advantage of opportunities to socialize, for example, through community activities. Any of these strategies might help reduce loneliness and prevent anxiety and depression, in particular, ongoing social support, peer groups to share experiences and changing thinking about self and others. It's very clear that supported co-design of interventions is valued by young people and advocated by charities. 
So effective strategies might require several content components from the framework we've suggested. And overall, I think the evidence so far suggests that a range of interventions can reduce loneliness in young people, and this may have the potential to both prevent and alleviate anxiety and depression. Thank you very much. Great, thank you um, to all the speakers. Um, my internet connection seems to be a little bit unstable, so I hope I don't fade out before I've set my uh, pit. So uh, we're now moving on to the panel uh, discussion part. Uh, and what we're hoping is that um, everyone will keep their microphones muted uh, while each panelist gives a very short response to the talks. Um, and then the discussion will be uh, open to questions and comments uh, from the audience. And I try to share this as best I can. And you can submit the questions via the um, chat function. So I'm going to introduce you to the panelists and I would like if the panelists would give their response in the order in which I am, I am uh, introducing them here. So um, the first panelist is Professor Ross Shafran, who is Professor of Translational Psychology at the uh, UCL uh, Great Ormond Street Institute of Child Health. And she's also a co-investigator on this uh, network. She's an honorary consultant clinical psychologist and founded the Charlie Waller Institute of Evidence-Based Psychological Treatment in 2007 at the University of Reading and was its director until 2012. Uh, she currently serves on the NIHR HTA Mental Health Panel and is a nice expert advisor. Uh, we've got also two uh, young people on the panel today. So Lizzie Mitchell is a final year psychology student and she's also been a youth advisor who has been involved in the UCL project investigating the impact of chronic loneliness on anxiety and depression, but also involved in, in a number of mental health initiatives more uh, broadly. Helena Tadesse is uh, part of the Loneliness and Social Isolation uh, Mental Health Research Net Network co-production group and she's also involved in the Active Ingredients project that Ellie has just uh, spoken about. Professor Sarah Garfinkel um, is professor at the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience uh, here at UCL, where she leads the Clinical and Effective Neuroscience Group. Uh, she's also a member of the network, and her current work focuses on brain-body interactions underlying emotion and cognition, with a particular focus on the heart. And she adopts a translational perspective and investigates altered emotion and cardiac neural mechanisms in different clinical conditions such as anxiety, psychosis and uh, autism. And finally, Dr. Alison McKinley works as a research fellow at the Institute of Epidemiology and Health here at UCL. She's a team member of the COVID-19 social study that is led by Dr. Daisy Fancourt and she utilizes qualitative methods to investigate the mental health and social impact of the pandemic. So Ross, would you like to start by offering your uh, reflections? Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to start by thanking everyone for such fantastic and stimulating talks. And the sort of the multidisciplinarity aspect really shines through in terms of the varying methodologies, all pointing towards um, understanding loneliness in youth better and potential interventions. I suppose if I had to have sort of one overriding thought it's it's a professional thought but it's also the thought as a parent who's had three teenagers in the house during the pandemic and it, it's about social media and um from sam's talk um I, it was very moving i thought that the, the sort of the quote you read out about somebody going through social media seeing the parties they're not invited to and this is and breaking lockdown, to be honest. And I think that's been very difficult because there has been breaking lockdown and people post it on social media and it, it's caused huge amounts of the sense of being different, um, either in your moral values um, or in being invited to things. And it, it's been very challenging. So I can see really clearly from a, a personal as well as professional perspective, how that impacts. And it seems to me a really, you know, not such a, a long way down to the um, cyber victimization that Tim so eloquently spoke about. And sometimes I think working in this field, we become slightly immune to words like anxiety and depression and loneliness. And as your teenager is sobbing and sobbing and sobbing, 
because of a nasty message. And you say, well, why did you go on the app that allows people to post anonymous nasty messages about you? And then it just, it, 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 it's, it's very, very difficult to understand as a parent not being brought up with social media, the importance of social media and the bringing it with you wherever you go, all hours of the day and night. So I think these are just massive things for children and young people. Um, and Ellie, obviously, it came up in um, the work that we did, too, about the importance of social media. And I think the first thing I did in the pandemic, actually, was attend a seminar by one of the other networks. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing about social media and rolling teenagers, because they're on the media, on social media such a lot. And there are clearly some good things, but it's also clearly here to stay. So I think bearing in mind the strength of our multidisciplinarity and our working together, I think that the challenge is upon us to help young people become resilient um, within social media to try and prevent loneliness. And whether or not that's social media literacy um, type of interventions, or whether or not there's some tech interventions that can help in terms of alerts, all of these things will require all of us. But for me, my response to all of these talks is it, it, it's an urgent problem that we really need to get our heads around to help prevent further mental health problems. Thank you, Ross. That was a really super start um, to the um, discussion panel and, and lovely reflection of all the great talks that uh, we had. Um, and uh, Lisi, I think it's great that we now have a young person who can respond and go on from that. Thank you. Um, so I'm one of the young people that was involved in the project Ellie was talking about, about the active ingredients to loneliness, which was just such a great project to be involved in. And I'm really pleased that I've been able to come along and hear all the talks because it's just amazing. And I was so happy that Sonia was saying that young people aged 16 to 24 have been prioritised because I think it's a time in life that often gets overlooked. I think school children tend to get a lot of like interventions and things but then once you leave school and you're kind of like thrown out into the big wide world and it's a time of a lot of change where you're like maybe moving away or starting a new job or going to uni um and there's just so many changes and it can be very overwhelming and very lonely um and i think what struck me the most was the quotes that sam pulled up from his study um about kind of it really resonated with me how when I felt really lonely and I guess I suffered chronic loneliness as a child you kind of you blame yourself for it you think there's something wrong with you and you think you're lonely because no one likes you and because you don't matter and no one cares when actually I think it's the stigma of being lonely that stops people speaking out about it um, and it is a really shared experience I think especially over the last year during Covid I'm sure we've all felt lonely at times but I think when it's a chronic problem that's when it becomes really risky so I think the word lonely being thrown around a lot kind of can degrade it from what it is um, so I'm really happy that this research is being done and I really hope that it gets down to the ground and like school children can hear about it and kind of learn about why they feel lonely and understand that feeling a bit more so they stop blaming themselves for it and they can kind of work to find different interventions because like Ros just said social media is here to stay it's not going anywhere and I think you're kind of caught between the devil and the deep blue sea with that because you're low if you go on social media you feel lonely because you're looking at all the stuff you're missing out on but then if you don't go on it you feel lonely because you feel like you're missing out and then all your friends will be talking about oh did you see what so and so posted on instagram and then obviously you don't if you don't have instagram you don't know and you can't be part of that conversation so yeah i think there's definitely a lot of barriers to navigate around but i think this research is going to really help to improve things for young people Thank you, Lizzie. That was really, really powerful and uh, and really helpful to hear. Helena, are you um, able to go next? Is Helena on the call still? Oh, yeah. I think your your mic is off, darling. Hi. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you now. All right. Um, sorry, I'm in a bit of a weird place, uh, but this is the, yeah, this is the best place I could find. Um, I, yeah, I'm really happy that this research is going on, and I feel like 
especially someone with an experience of um, loneliness. When I, um, you know, came out of um, care, you know, you get a lot of responsibilities. You're responsible for budgeting, making food and all of that. But previously, you were just in, in a home and everyone was just doing everything for you. You never had to think about um, real stuff. So when you get thrown out and, you know, everything is just like, what's going on? And like children in care are, um, I mean, as a child who was in care, um, I used to think, you know, uh, I, I used to think I was very lonely, but I didn't understand what it was until um, I kind of grew up. But the biggest part uh, of like, what actually when I when I realized I was going through loneliness and um, you know I guess I became more aware is when my a very close friend died when we were living in a hostel and I remember helping this person um, apply for jobs I remember he was in debt and all of all, he had a lot of stresses in his life and you know, after I went through that and I realized a lot more about life and I was more connected to the earth, I, uh, I realized exactly what I was feeling and what I was going through and what the causes were. And being part of the co-production groups has really helped me kind of um, understand that um, all the solutions that I thought would have helped me um, are really going to be useful now and they are being used to bring change and I'm really happy about that. Um, I feel like, as I've said in many of the other meetings, the biggest part, especially as a person with um, care, uh, lived experience of being in care, um, I think because um, I, I feel like at that point in my life, nobody was teaching me anything. Um, so when I came out into the world, I didn't know anything about energy and like how to like balance all, all my emotions um, because there was no one to guide me. So when I grew up, it was like, how can I actually um, just, you know, control all the stresses in my life how can I be more connected uh, to my body? Because, yeah, that's what I realized is actually helping me. So things like exercises where I can feel my body. So like yoga or Pilates or, you know, just breathing exercises um, helped me calm down. It made me feel more connected to myself and my surroundings um, so that, kind of helped me realize a lot of things because I am focusing more on myself and how my environment and everything else in my life affects the way I feel yeah. and I feel like I've had to do that because um, I've had to sort of teach myself and that is what life is about teaching yourself most of the time but you know other people are lucky enough to have their biological parents or like uh, because you know you're more connected and loved and you're taught properly I guess is what I'm trying to say but when you're not taught properly and you know there are also other people who are in similar shoes as, as you like it's it's harder basically than being in your own uh, kind of family home where you've got all the attention that you need uh, to develop properly um, and in the way I guess your contribution for the for the network has very much to bring a much more diverse perspective because I think we might have our standard loneliness questionnaires and think about that we're assessing a certain experience but the experience may actually be very varied and and, and very different depending on what your experience has been as you've developed I think we can re return to those teams I think I need to go next to Sarah and then we can take questions but we can return to all of these things so thank you Helena that's really helpful thank Sarah, you can go next hi thank you I'd like to also 
thank the very interesting series of speakers and the very moving reflections from um, Lizzie and Helena. Thank you so much. Um, I think what I'm taken with is the cross-disciplinary nature of loneliness and mental health. And that's why I think it's so important that the Catalyst Network and the Loneliness Network really are uniting people from all different disciplines to try and tackle these big questions. I think the talk um, talks from Sam and Tim highlighted on a society level um, uh, issues of deprivation, issues of neglect, and how they might contribute. Genetics was also highlighted um, by Tim, and Ellie really um, highlighted how intertwined loneliness is with anxiety and depression, and then looking at it as a potential intervention, um, I think is so important. My own work speaks to how deeply entwined anxiety and depression are with loneliness. Um, so I just want to really say how happy I am that we're all together to talk about these issues from these different perspectives. Um, and I look forward to yeah, hearing uh, further questions. Thanks, Sarah. Now, Alison, do you want to have a brief reflection? We open uh, the panel for questions. Please post questions to the uh, chat. And also, if there's questions to the speakers, do, do post that as well. Great. I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much to the speakers for presenting um, some really interesting summaries on the the work from their research. Um, I especially enjoyed the, the use of methods uh, that Sam spoke about, uh, uh, using arts as a way of uh, expressing uh, complex emotions and thoughts. And I think uh, what he mentioned around this, this feeling of being disconnected, it really chimes with uh, that, uh, well, some of the findings actually that we've seen in the qualitative interviews from the COVID-19 social study that I've been involved with. And it's like there's this kind of paradox between um, feeling disconnected, um, but also trying to adapt uh, using, you know, chat functions on gaming platforms to try and connect with other people during the pandemic, um, using uh, more dating apps and uh, social media and things like that to connect with people. Um, but also this um, perhaps a a reservation about socializing again after the pandemic. And um, I think this is where uh, Ali's work talking about um, potential solutions to loneliness can be uh, particularly applicable to the work that we're doing, trying to support young people after COVID um, in terms of um, you know, peer support groups and sort of interventions that are targeting um, particularly those who might be feeling anxious about socializing whilst at the same time feeling very lonely and desperate for connection with others. Um, so yeah, again, I'm really looking forward to some of the, the Q&A that we'll be having about these, these talks. Thank you. Great. Um, so far, we don't have any questions at the talk, but we do have a lot of people um, uh, you know, expressing their thanks for Lissy and Helena for being um, so honest and open and brave in sharing their experiences and highlighting how um, diverse those experiences can be. I'm hoping someone else might ask a question apart from myself. I, I, but I've got a sort of a starter for 10. Um, so this is really for all the panel members and the speakers to, to reflect um, how you know, the research might benefit from cross-disciplinary work and how it might incorporate these um, voices of people from lived experience. So I guess I'm thinking all the academics who are in the panel or who've given talks, what are your thoughts in terms of how you might tweak your research, what we might do in terms of developing measures, what we might need to do in terms of how we focus the research, given the really diverse set of experiences of loneliness, and uh, maybe maybe Lissy and uh, kind of Helena may be able to reflect reflect a little bit on is there something out there already that is helpful? And Helena raised exercise, and that's really I think it's interesting because I think a lot of people during lockdown have have discovered yoga and other things because they have felt isolated and they felt like they they need to do something uh, that is helpful. But it'd be good to sort of think how can you reach across disciplines and how can you you incorporate these sort of very personal experiences into the research while still going ahead in a rigorous way. And I'm going to pick on Ross to start. Me? Yes. 
So I, I think when the, the multidisciplinarity is a massive strength when there's a common language. So my experience when it's sort of artificial and you put people together in a room, but you actually don't have that common language and common goal, then I think it becomes more challenging. So um, we do have a common goal. My, I'm interested in intervention work, but then I listen to Sarah and Sarah's work is, you know, applies to intervention, but it's a completely different angle. So I think that there is, that there are lots of different ways to address the sort of the research priorities. But for me, the research priority is to use our collective strengths to develop accessible, scalable interventions. Um, and and the, the interesting thing, I think, um, the, you know, stigma was mentioned by Lizzie. And in some of the um, sort of some, some trials, that are internet based. So they're, they're internet based, not even face to face in Sweden. My colleagues were saying the hardest trials to recruit to are loneliness because there is still such a stigma attached to it. So we need everybody to work together to address all, you know, all the different aspects in order to develop interventions, but also to help people access them and not to feel stigmatized by them. I don't know if that answers your question, Essie. If I I think, I think that's really, really helpful. And I guess I was, I was also thinking just the, the very contrasting talks by Sam and uh, Tim where, uh, you know, there was uh, seeking, you know, what are the qualitative experiences of loneliness? That was Sam's research. Um, but then Tim, Tim's research using very standard instruments, but suggesting that there might be some kind of individual characteristics that maybe in, influence how you experience particular situations. Uh, which yes. may look objectively similar but might be very different. And I was also struck by, you know, Sam, the qualitative brings it to life, and I'm a big fan of qualitative and we need it, but you do also need the data aspect and that larger context. And I think it's like having these different pieces of the jigsaw, isn't it? Um, and you think that you're creating one thing, or the, you know, what if the analogy is with a with a with different with blind people feeling an elephant you think oh this is an animal with one thing this if you've got different areas it's only really when it comes together that you can see the whole and that you can apply it for different people and they're very very different circumstances as Helena really illustrated very clearly I mean she's got very different experiences to to somebody else and we want to be able to be appealing and to develop interventions and help and support for everybody yeah that's a very good point but it's a slightly related question, and this is to Sam in the chat. Um, uh, the question is, did your participants talk about deprivation or ethnicity in their experiences of loneliness? And if so, did this impact their relationships? And, and it might be good to also hear from the young people, you know, whether they feel either from, by, from their own experience or talking to others that, you know, you know, this has impacted their experience. So Sam, do you want to go first? And then I'll, I'll take Helena or Lissi if they're happy to talk. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, we had a number of our participants who talked about ethnicity. Um, like, for example, we had um, some people from, um, uh, well, they were um, by African um, descent and they, they, they commented that um, they are neglected within society because of their race. And, um, and, uh, and unfortunately, you know, they feel disconnected and and they feel like they can't voice their opinions and 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 and, and so on. So um, race did come up. I mean, it wasn't a major contributor or a major factor, but it did come up by some of the participants. Helena and Lissy, are you, you know, do you either have personal or experience from friends which concurs with that or agrees with that, what Sam said, or disagrees? <laughs> Um, hello? Hello? Helena, can you hear us? Okay, we may have to come back to that. I think there may be a, may be a technical hiccup. Um, there's a question for Tim, how we're open to others too. Um, interesting to hear about impact of neglect and bullying. Is there an element of the research that covers bullying and neglect that young people might be subject to by an adult where young persons may feel even more unable to confront or, or inform another adult of the situation. Um, yeah, I think definitely that um, that sort of imbalance of power definitely um, plays an important role um, 
the impact of, of victimization. And um, to reiterate something that um, Ross said earlier, the uh, the um, integration of qualitative and quantitative methods really helps us get at that. Um, so um, I've recently done some qualitative research um, on uh, really severely uh, lonely uh, individuals and um, victimization features very, very often in, in their, their life histories and um, uh, bullying being the most common one. And um, there is very much, yeah, the um, a sense of powerlessness against the perpetrator. Um, and I think that could be a, yeah extremely sort of isolating experience. A few questions for some, which I'm going to amalgamate, and they are about whether the young people from deprived areas or better socioeconomic situations differed in their experiences in loneliness, um, or whether there were differences between men and women. What is your sense? Yeah, sure. Um, well, there is actually no study based on our knowledge that on young people um, from better socioeconomic situation. So we actually proposed this as a future study recommendation. Um, but in our study, money, lack of money and the pressure um, to earn money and so on did come up by a number of our participants, by a large group of people actually. So money does seem to be a factor in, 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 in the experience of loneliness. Some said they feel under such a pressure to work that they don't have enough time for social interactions. Um, so this is actually a barrier for them to connect. Some said that they don't have the money to be able to meet up with friends and when, you know, they, they see pictures of their friends going out and so on, but they can't participate because they don't have the financial means to be able to attend. Um, so there was that aspect of money that seemed to be an important contributor. Um, okay, Ellie is also highlighting that the financial barriers came up in, our, in the active uh, ingredients uh, review as well and if I can have a very brief answer to whether there's differences between men and women and then I would like to have one more discussion point that can hopefully pull in Ellie and uh, and the young young people panelists before we have to sign off. Yeah sure um, overall men and women seem to be quite equal in terms of their experience of loneliness however there were some differences in social comparison and the experience of unwanted feelings and emotions. So more women were much more likely to engage in social comparison compared to women. And they were also much more likely to experience uh, sadness, depression, anxiety. So these, all these negative unwanted, you know, mental and psychological and emotional processes. Uh, we're much more prevalent. Yeah, Sam, I think I'm going to have to move because I'm really conscious that Ellie hasn't had a chance to say anything. Oh, I'm so sorry. I thought they were, I'm really sorry. I didn't realize. Yeah. So Ellie, I really noticed that it, in your talk, you talked about that, you know, we need more trials, good quality trials. Um, but I guess what I'm still sort of thinking, well, if we want to develop new things to go to trials, do we really know what would be the kind of the key things to focus on? And, you know, the young people can either jump in or or if you know if you've had discussions with them has there been something that has come up from the discussions with the young people as to what would be most uh, most useful and a slightly related point that is in the chat people sort of talk about the fact that nhs often offers cbt but you know would group therapy sessions potentially be better and i guess that maybe depends on who who you're talking to yeah, so we're actually doing some work trying to answer these questions at the moment. So we've got, uh, we're going to be doing some interviews with young people based on this framework to talk about what they would find most successful, what might work for them. Um, and we're also putting in a funding bid to co-produce uh, an intervention, which we think will probably be modular so that the different people have different choices um, depending on what they need. So some people might need psychological um, therapies and others actually maybe the problem is being isolated and they need social um, opportunities uh, based on their interests so that work is ongoing and hopefully we'll have answers to that soon I think the group CBT um, that makes sense to me because I think a very strong mechanism of action that came out was seeing that you weren't the only person experiencing something and being able to talk about your experience, which made you felt feel very different from others, 
with other people who had similar experiences. So that would make sense to me. But I think that I sort of connects with what Lissy was also saying in terms of kind of feeling that people understand exactly. how you're feeling. And that maybe there may be some thought required as to who are part of the group. Because when I heard Lissy, when I heard Helena, it was a very different experience. So it may mm -hmm. be also helpful to meet other people who, who have had similar experiences, but maybe also have some exposure to people who have different experiences to sort of uh, normalize it a little bit and, and kind of help you make connections uh, and realize you're not the perhaps the only person who's feeling that way. And I'm going to finish off by a question to Lissy. You spoke about self-blame and someone in the chat is asking, why do you think this is so prevalent in young people's experience of loneliness? Do people accuse young people of not trying enough or, or do you think that this is just, you know, you're forming your identity identity and you just um you know it's easy to feel that uh, you're not doing things right yeah um and that's a great question i really had to think about that i think for me it was probably because like when people when i told people i was lonely they thought i meant like in a social aspect so as in like i didn't have enough friends or i just needed to like you know make some more friends or go out with them or like yeah i guess try a bit harder but I guess I was kind of lonely in the sense that I had a lot of friends but I just felt like none of them understood me and I guess it links back to what Sonia had on her first slide it's like a lack of high quality connections I had connections but they just weren't very good quality and I felt like my family and friends didn't really understand that they were just kind of like oh you know I remember telling my dad and he was like oh you know you're not lonely you live with five other people like you've got loads of friends I feel like a lot of it is kind of lack of understanding about what loneliness actually is um and i think the onus is always on the person to try harder or you know make more friends but it's not always that simple and i think especially like ellie mentioned the knock-on effects of loneliness like social anxiety and low self-esteem and things like that and then that makes it even harder to then make friends so i felt like i blame myself because i thought being lonely was my fault because no one liked me and that I was a problem and I didn't matter and no one cared and yeah and I guess I felt like all those things were my fault. There's so, also Helena has uh, has put reflections to the chat that sort of continue on this theme where she says that ethnicity and race were a big contributor to loneliness because in the schools that she went to they had no ethnic minorities so she found it very difficult to find her place and had to spend most moments uh, alone. Mm -hmm. And Helena, if you could offer one final reflection, what what do you think would be would be kind of helpful um, to sensitively offer to to young people who were in in the position that you describe? Um, sorry. So, are you saying um, what kind of solutions would have helped someone? myself in that at that well, time if you, if you could think of let's say top three things that you think might have been might have been useful and and maybe are not not sort of offered enough yeah i think um like there was a garden at school for example and i feel like when people feel like they don't have a space they fit in uh, i felt like we should have been able to say you know, can I just quickly come out of the lesson? I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed. I'd like to perhaps sit at the garden or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like just ha being given opportunities to just take a break when you need to and just come back to yourself. I think that's one way of um, just helping someone um, kind of find their place, trying to earn, like, freeing them so that they can um, find somewhere they feel comfortable in so that they can have the confidence to perhaps you know start conversations because they although the the crowd doesn't really reflect them they can um, get the confidence to um, perhaps not not focus on that too tough or like not to take and not take um certain things personally um yeah 
I mean, one thing I could I would say when I when I'm talking about taking things personally is, for example, we would be in a class and we'd be talking about Africa and then some people would have um, uh, very um, alarming views or like they would just be viewing certain things um, very differently, which I at that time did not understand. Um, so at that point, I would have loved the opportunity to perhaps, you know, can I go outside and take a break? And um, because schools are very, you know, they're very, they stick to the timetable. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. Giving more opportunity to have a break and understand. Because, other sorry, I think there's a lag. I was in it. It's really, really interesting what you say. There is. Um, a very recent uh, research kind of um, theory paper that has been published which sort of talks about how we're not good enough in accommodating in educational settings to the fact that people may not all learn in the same way or they may not all find having uh, particular activities in the same way uh, natural to them um, and that obviously can increase your sense of feeling isolated um, yeah that's right okay. I think I'm very conscious that we have, have run about seven minutes over the um, over the time. There are lots of extremely good comments on the uh, on the chat, and they, that clearly shows that uh, people have found this very uh, thought provoking. Um, lots of thanks to all the speakers uh, in the chat, and I, I feel the same way, and also to the panel members. And, and people have been particularly. Um, moved to hear from Lissy and, and from Helena and, and from your personal experiences and has really helped to bring this topic alive. So thank you for having the courage uh, to share uh, your personal experience uh, to a bunch of talking heads on the Zoom. That's uh, really good of you to do that. So there will be um, another Catalyst seminar in uh, about a month's time, 14th of April, and we will try to advertise it uh, um, well, and this will uh, this seminar will be on uh, social inequalities and um, well, particularly financial social inequalities and um, and uh, mental health. So we already we will have very interesting speakers, and I hope as many of you as possible can make uh, that seminar next month. So thank you, everybody. Apologies for running slightly over, but I think uh, we have all been really happy to hear from Lucy and Helena and uh, the rest of the crew. So thank you very much. And thank you, Sonia, for heading this. Thanks, Ceci.